Hey guys, this is Vyom Joshi with Superior North. Welcome back to my channel. Today we will be talking about Hewlett Packard, also known as HP. HP provides printers, printing supplies, personal computers, mobile devices, and other related products and services. In this video, we will be talking about the company's business by going over its annual report, then review the company's fundamentals by focusing on its key ratios, and finally find the intrinsic value of the company. So let's dive in and review HP. Hey guys, let's start off by looking at the Form 10K, which is the annual report that HP filed with the SEC. This is for the fiscal year that ended October 31st, 2021. And on page 5 of this report, the company provides us a business overview. HP claims that it is a leading global provider of personal computing and other access devices, imaging and printing products, and related technologies, solutions, and services. It sells to individual consumers, small and medium-sized businesses, and large enterprises, including customers in government, health, and education sectors. In the next paragraph, the company specifies that after its 2015 split, HP, that is Hewlett Packard Company, and Hewlett Packard Enterprise are two separate entities. For this report, we will be focusing on the Hewlett Packard Company. The company has three reportable segments, personal systems, printing, and corporate investments. The personal systems segment offers commercial and consumer desktop and notebook PCs, workstations, thin clients, commercial mobility devices, retail point-of-sale systems, displays and peripherals, software support and services. HP points out that both commercial and consumer PCs maintain multi-operating segments, multi-architecture strategies using Microsoft Windows and Google Chrome operating segments, and predominantly use processors from Intel and AMD. After that, HP discusses the difference between commercial and consumer PCs. Commercial PCs are optimized for use by enterprise public sector, which includes education and SMB customers with a focus on robust design, security, serviceability, connectivity, reliability, and manageability of the customer's environment and working remotely. The consumer PCs, on the other hand, are optimized for consumer usage, focusing on gaming, learning, and working remotely, consuming multimedia for entertainment, managing personal life activities, staying connected, sharing information, getting things done for work, including creating content, staying informed, and secure. Next, notebooks consist of consumer notebooks, commercial notebooks, mobile workstations, peripherals, and commercial mobility devices. Desktops include consumer desktops, commercial desktops, thin clients, displays, peripherals, and retail point-of-sale systems. Workstations consist of desktop workstations, displays, and peripherals, and others consist of consumer and commercial services as well as other personal systems capabilities. HP's second business segment is its printing segment. Printing provides consumer and commercial printer hardware, supplies, services, and solutions. Printing is also focused on graphics and 3D imaging solutions. The office printing solutions deliver HP's office printers, supplies, services, and solutions to small businesses and large enterprises. The home printing solution delivers innovative printing products, supplies, services, and solutions for home, home businesses, and micro-business customers utilizing both HP's ink and laser technologies. For both of these solutions, HP uses some of Samsung branded supplies. Next, the Graphing Solutions delivers large format commercial and industrial solutions and supplies to print service providers and packaging converters. The 3D and Digital Manufacturing offers a portfolio of additive manufacturing solutions and supplies to help customers succeed in their additive and digital manufacturing journey. Lastly, the Printing Business segment groups its global business capabilities into the following business units. The Commercial consists of Office Printing Solutions. The Consumer consists of Home Printing Solutions and the supplies comprises a set of highly innovative consumer products ranging from ink and laser cartridges to media, graphic solutions, and 3D printing and digital manufacturing supplies. HP's third and last business segment is its corporate investment segment. The corporate investment includes HP Labs and certain business incubation and investment projects. Now that we have a brief understanding of HP's three business segments, let's go to page 70 of this annual report where the company provides us information about the revenue breakdown across its operating segments. For the fiscal year 2021, the company's total net revenue amounted to about $63.5 billion, out of which the personal system segment amounted to about $43 billion, the printing segment amounted to about $20 billion, and the corporate investments brought in about $3 million. When we look at each segment's revenue trend over the past three years, we can see that the personal system segment has been growing every year for the past three years. The printing segment saw a dip in the year 2020. This makes sense because due to the pandemic, most of the offices were shut down, hence the printing segment did see a drop in the revenue. However, in 2021, after the reopening, the company's printing revenue exceeded that seen in the year 2019. And this tiny corporate investment segment also saw a growth from $2 million in 2020 to $3 million in 2021. Holistically, when we look at the total net revenue over the past three years, 
The company did see a drop in its net revenue in 2020. However, the revenue numbers have recovered in the year 2021. Now, these are all the sales numbers, but it's important for us to also look at how much money is left over once it pays for all the costs and expenses. And that's where we come to the earnings before taxes number. Personal system segment reported an earnings before taxes of $3.1 billion. The printing segment reported an earnings of about $3.6 billion. And the corporate investment segment reported a loss of about $96 million. The total segment earnings from operations amounted to about $6.6 .6 billion. In 2020, the company's total sales earnings amounted to about $4.7 billion. And in the year 2019, it was about $5 billion. So we can see that the company's total segment earnings seen in the year 2021 was higher than that seen before the pandemic. Finally, looking at the total earnings before taxes, for the fiscal year 2021, this number amounted to about $7.5 billion. This number was significantly higher than that seen in the previous two years. This is because of the one-time Oracle litigation proceeds of about $2.3 billion, which was captured under the interest and other net line item. Now that we have a brief understanding of HP's business, its three reportable segments, and its revenue breakdown, let's review the company's fundamentals by focusing on its key ratios. Hey guys, I'm on Morningstar looking at HP Inc. Under key ratios, we have the financials. The first item on the list is the revenue. The revenue is the top line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that the company brings in via sales. In 2012, the company's revenue was $120 billion. In 2015, there was a split where HP Enterprise split from HP Inc. So the post-split revenue in 2016 was $48 billion. And ever since then, the company's revenue has slowly been trending upwards. In 2021, the company reported a revenue of about $63 billion. And since HP split up in 2015, for the purposes of this analysis, we'll just be looking at numbers reporting 2016 and onwards. Next, looking at the operating income. The operating income is the amount of money that's left with the company once we subtract the cost of goods and operating expenses from the company's revenue. Back in 2016, the company's operating income was about $4 billion. And for the year 2021, it was about $5.6 billion. The company's operating income has been increasing every year since 2019. Next is the net income. The net income is the bottom line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that's left with the company once it pays for the cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations, and taxes. Back in 2016, the company's net income was about $2.5 billion. And for the year 2021, it was about $6.5 billion. HP's net income in the year 2021 was a lot higher than that seen in 2020 or 2019. This is because HP received a one-time Oracle litigation proceed of $3.2 billion in 2021. However, since 2016, the company has always reported a positive net income number, which tells us that HP has always been profitable. Next, looking at the dividends per share. Back in 2016, the company paid out about $0.49 cent per share as dividend. And for the training 12 months, that number had increased to about $0.83 cent per share as dividend. HP has been increasing its dividends every year since 2016. After that, looking at the shares outstanding. Back in 2016, the company had 1,743 million shares outstanding. And for the training 12 months, that number had decreased to 1,170 million shares outstanding. The company has been buying back its shares every year since 2016. This is good news for existing shareholders as when a company buys back its shares, it actually helps increase the existing shareholders' ownership within the company. HP's consistent share buybacks and the hikes in its dividend payouts show that the company's management is shareholder friendly. Next is the book value per share. The book value is what we get when we subtract the company's total liabilities from its total assets. Ever since 2016, the company has reported a negative book value per share. This means that the company has more liabilities than assets on its balance sheet. A negative book value per share is not necessarily a bad thing because in HP's case, the reason why the company has negative book value per share is because of the excessive share buybacks that the company does. Finally, looking at the free cash flow, the free cash flow is what we get when we subtract the capital spending from the company's operating cash flow. Back in 2016, the company's free cash flow was about $2.8 billion. And for the year 2021, it was about $5,827 million. Ideally, we want the company's free cash flow number to be positive, staying steady or increasing. HP's free cash flow for the most part has been trending upwards. I will be using the 2021 free cash flow number of $5,827 million for my discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. Next, look at the profitability of the company, focusing on the net margin. The net margin is the ratio of the company's bottom line to its top line. So it compares the company's net income to its revenue. Back in 2016, the company's net margin was about 5.17%. And for the training 12 months, that number is about 10.05%. What this means is every $100 that the company made in sales over the past 12 months, by the time it paid for its cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations, and taxes, it had $10.05 left as pure profit. 
Next, the company does not report any return on equity because the company's equity is negative due to the excessive buybacks. When we look at the company's return on invested capital, the return on invested capital gives an idea of how good the management is at allocating the company's capital and getting a return on that investment. For that, we can quickly go to the Guru Focus, where HP's weighted average cost of capital, which is the hurdle rate, is about 7.65%. And since the company's return on invested capital right now is about 18.47%, which is much higher than the company's weighted average cost of capital, we can safely say that the company's management is creating value for its shareholders. Next, we look at the company's interest coverage. The interest coverage is the ratio of the company's income to its interest obligations. So it gives an idea of how many times can the company pay off its interest using its income in that calendar year. Back in 2017, the company's interest coverage was about 11.6 times. And for the training 12 months, it's about 31 times. Benjamin Graham, the father of value investing, preferred to only invest in securities that had an interest coverage of five times or higher. Now let's look at the financial health and liquidity ratios. The first item on the list is the current ratio. The current ratio compares the company's current assets to its current liabilities. Ideally, we want the company's current ratio to be greater than 1.0, as that tells us that the company has enough assets to fulfill its liabilities over the next 12 months. Back in 2016, the company's current ratio was at 0.98, and for the latest quarter, it's at 0.74. Next, looking at the quick ratio. The quick ratio is similar to the current ratio, except we disregard the inventory component. In other words, quick ratio is equal to current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. Ideally, we want to see the company's quick ratio to be greater than 1.0, as that tells us that the company does not have to rely on selling its inventory in order to fulfill its current liabilities. Back in 2016, the company's quick ratio was at 0.69, and for the latest quarter, it's at 0.40. HP's current and quick ratios are fairly in line with those of its competitor, Dell. Finally, we do not have any numbers reported for the financial leverage and debt-to-equity ratios because the company's equity is negative. And anytime we have negative financial leverage and negative debt-to-equity ratios, they're not meaningful. Now let's look at the efficiency ratios. The first item on the list is the day sales outstanding. This number gives an idea of how many days go by from the day the company recognizes its sale to the day it actually receives cash for that service rendered. Back in 2016, the company's day sales outstanding was about 66 days, and for the year 2021, it was about 31 days. Ideally, we wanted the company's day sales outstanding number to be staying steady or decreasing. What we do not want to see is a company whose day sales outstanding number is growing rapidly as that tells us that the company is being aggressive with its accounting as it's trying to recognize its revenue sooner so that it can inflate its income numbers on its income statement. In the case of HP, the company's day sales outstanding number have stayed fairly consistent since 2017. Next is the day's inventory. This number gives an idea of how many days does the company's product sit in its inventory before it's sold. Back in 2016, the company's day's inventory was about 51 days, and for the year 2021, it was about 50 days. Ideally, we want the company's day's inventory number to be staying steady or decreasing, what we do not want to see is a company whose day's inventory number is growing because that tells us that the company's inventory is just sitting around on its balance sheet. We'd rather see those inventory numbers be pushed onto the company's income statement and be realized as a profit. Next is the payables period. This number gives an idea of how many days does the company take to pay its suppliers. Back in 2016, the company took about 125 days to pay its suppliers. And for the year 2021, that number had decreased to about 112 days. Ideally, we want the company's payables period to be staying steady or decreasing. What we do not want to see is a company whose payable spirit is growing rapidly, as it tells us that the company's management is holding on to its cash in order to artificially inflate its cash flow numbers on its cash flow statement. So in the case of HP, the company's management does not appear to be playing any accounting tricks to artificially inflate the company's income or cash flow numbers. Now let's look at the company's current valuation. The first item on the list is the price to earnings ratio. HP's PE is at 6.8. The company does not have a meaningful price to book ratio since its book value is negative due to the excessive buybacks that the company has done. Next is the price to sales. The company has a price to sales of 0.7. The company has a price to cash flow of 6.2. And the company has a dividend yield of 2.4%. If we compare HP's current valuation to its five-year average, we can see that on the price to earnings and price to cash flow metric, the company is currently undervalued. If you compare HP to the S&P 500, and the S&P 500 is the aggregate of the top 500 companies in the United States, and we can think of the S&P 500 as our opportunity cost. With that in mind, we can see that on all the valuation metrics, HP is undervalued when compared to the S&P 500. Now let's look at HP's discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. Over here, I pasted the company's 2021 free cash flow number that I got from Morningstar, which was $5,827 million. I'm assuming the annual growth rate of free cash flow to be 3%. What this means is I expect HP's free cash flow to grow at 3% every year for the next 10 years. I'm using a discount rate of 10%. What this means is I want this investment to give me an annual 10% return. In other words, I want to double my investment in about 7 years. 
I'm using a long-term growth rate of 2.92%. What this means is after the 10-year market into perpetuity, I expect the company's free cash flow to grow at 2.92%. This number is in line with the 30-year U.S. Treasury yield. The company has 1,170 million shares outstanding and has long-term debt of $6,386 million. After taking all of these inputs into account, we get the company's intrinsic value to be about $65 per share. When we compare this intrinsic value to the company's current stock price, which is about $37 per share, we can see that the company's current stock is trading about 42.3% below the company's intrinsic value. The way we calculate this intrinsic value is we look at what the free cash flows would be every year for the next 10 years. We sum up all those free cash flows, which come out to about $41 billion. Then we look at what the free cash flows would be after the 10-year mark in perpetuity. We sum all those up to get the intrinsic value to be about $82 billion. From this number, we subtract the long-term debt and divide by the shares outstanding to get the intrinsic value per share to be about $65. If we disregard the perpetuity component, in other words, if we think that HP is only going to grow for the next 10 years and then it'll cease to exist, then we get the intrinsic value without the perpetuity to be about $30 per share. If we disregard the debt, in other words, if you think that HP is going to grow into perpetuity, so there's no point for us to worry about the company paying off its debt, then we get the intrinsic value without the debt to be about $70 per share. Finally, let's run a goal seek analysis so that we can figure out what kind of return can you expect to get on this investment. If you were to invest in the security at the current stock price of $37.47 per share, we will run this analysis by changing our discount rate. What we get is if we were to invest in the security at the current stock price, we can expect to get an annual return of about 14.5% on this investment. Overall, HP has good fundamentals and it is an undervalued security. HP operates in a mature market, so it is unlikely that we would see a high growth in the company's top line number. HP's dividend and share buyback policies are shareholder friendly. HP generates about 35% of its revenue from the United States. So about two thirds of the revenue comes from overseas. So if there is a turmoil or economic downturn internationally, then it is likely that we would see a decline in HP's top line numbers. Lastly, Warren Buffett bought about $4.2 billion of HP stock. This amounts to him holding about 11% of all the shares outstanding of this company. Hey guys, that is all I had for you this week. Hopefully you found this video on HP interesting. If you like this content, please do like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions on which stock I should view next, please leave it in the comment section below. I'll greatly appreciate it. Thank you.